Okay. So welcome everyone. Thank you for coming today. I um, appreciate, I think we had 40 something people on by the time um, you were finished with the intro. Thank you, Lori. Thanks to the library for hosting me. So what we're going to be doing today is talking about organizing and decluttering from the lens of uh, ADHD. And it's important because sometimes things don't work according to plan or according to some of the more traditional books. So um, I do work with a lot of people who have um, ADHD. And so it's important for me to give different type of tactics that um, you might not have heard of. So we'll be talking about the essential steps to any decluttering project. And then we're going to jump into some of the executive functioning that um, will affect people's ability to declutter, to organize, prioritize um, productivity um, from ADHD. So uh, we'll be talking about one of the models from one of the experts and how we can work around that within the organizing process. I'll be going pretty quickly, giving as much information as I can. I'll have a few spots to jump in with questions um, and um, definitely can answer questions at the end as well. Um, and people can email me too. Um, so what I want to do real quick is just give you a basis for where this information is coming from. I started my professional organizing business in 2015. Um, and I have been learning not only on the job and from colleagues when I used to work for other colleagues, but um, through education, seminars, webinars, um, books, classes, all sorts of things. So I've earned specialist certificates through the Institute for Challenging Disorganization. Um, I became a certified professional organizer, which um, you have to do a lot of uh, study for that and um, have enough um, enough hours to sit for the exam. Um, and I attend um, all sorts of different um, all sorts of different conferences, regional and national. Um, and I've read over 50 books and I'm continuing to always read more so that I can use those tactics with clients. So that's me in a nutshell. I just want to let you know where this information is coming from. So this is not, let's see, there we go. Okay. So we're going to jump right in. Some of you may have seen this before. Um, this is the acronym I like to use when I'm talking about the decluttering process. So I use the acronym STOP as in stop the clutter from coming in, S-T-O-P. Um, and we're going to jump right in, but I wanted to show you in the circular motion here. We'll continue to do this so for the visual. It's a little easier to remember. Um, we'll talk about each one of these steps, sorting tossing, throwing away, organizing, and persevering. So in terms of the first step, we're going to sort like with like into categories. Most of the time when I go into people's homes, they have miscellaneous piles. Every once in a while, people already have things organized into categories, but most of the time not. And some people will say, well, why bother taking the time to sort items like with like, why not just dive in and make decisions right away? And there's a few reasons why we do this. One, it's too much of a cognitive load, meaning it's too much for our brain to work on. If we're popping from um, a, a t-shirt on top of a birthday card, um, and on top of a bill, on top of um, a plate from last night's dinner, our brain is just bopping around too much. And it's really hard to keep track of what we're doing. So by sorting like with like, we can alleviate that and it becomes easier. Uh, the other thing is that you are more aware of the total volume in any category that you're working with. Uh, if you can see it all at once. And so if you go to organize, I always use the example of t-shirts in a closet and you pull out the ones you don't want anymore and you feel like, okay, the closet's okay. I can get to what I need and easily put it away and get dressed. Um, that's great. But then you do the laundry 
and the system breaks down and it's because you had forgotten most likely that you had dirty laundry um, that was uh, t-shirts in the dirty laundry pile as well. And so that was part of um, the challenge. Now, I do realize a lot of people I work with, they can't possibly get to everything in one category in one fell swoop because they can't even, for instance, get to the closets, all the closets. So we might have to repeat this process a bit, but as much as we can, sorting into these categories is going to help you decide, wow, um, I thought I had maybe a foot worth of um, t-shirt space and I actually have three here. So um, I don't want to spend that much time or effort or space in my closet with that much in terms of t-shirt volume. So um, the other thing, and whoops, let me move this over so I can see a little bit better. There we go. Um, we want to start with broad categories. Uh, we don't want to micro organize here. And there's a few reasons for this. One is that generally we just don't have enough space to organize things into small categories um, because there's um, so much clutter around us, there's so much volume of possession. So what we need to do then um, is just do broad categories, maybe all the clothes together, all the papers together, things that need to go to the kitchen all together. And then we can do finer tune sorting within those um, when we get to other phases. Uh, additionally, too many categories really um, it is a crutch for us to keep too much because if there's only one or two items in each category, everything becomes special and unique. And then it's a lot harder to pare down your possessions because everything's special. Whereas if you have a broad category, then it's much easier to let go of items because um, you see the overlap with different, different types of items. So this is that sort, that first phase, and then we're going into, whoops, excuse me, one more. Um, too many categories means that it's going to take too much time to maintain your system once you have it. Uh, the more, for instance, categories you have in a file cabinet, the harder it's going to be to flip through and get to what you want. Now, we don't want to go to the other extreme where we just have papers as a category and that's it unless that works for you but we want to find a happy medium there so that is the sort phase and so now what we're jumping into is toss or throw away um, but this also includes recycling donating shredding selling um, i won't get into selling today that's a whole nother ball of wax um, you want to be careful there that it's not taking up too much time or energy. It, it can be enjoyable, but also it can set people off um, on, on a different track than they intended to go into. So there's some certain things I want to bring up about this phase. It's usually the hardest. Um, that's usually why people call me in because they're just having a hard time letting go. Um, but there's, there's things we can keep in mind as we're deciding what to let go of and what to keep. The less you keep, again, the easier it's going to be to find what you need because you're not having to look through 20 things in any one given place. There might only be 10 objects there, and it's a lot faster. And then also you're not having to duplicate purchases. So excuse me for just a moment. I always have allergies. <laughs> So um, also the less time, again, it will take to manage the things that you do decide to keep. Um, I want to mention hobbies here. A lot of people I work with, a lot of especially those with ADHD, have a lot of interest, varied interest in hobbies. And that's great. And they can change over time. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, what happens though is as we are going through the process, a lot of people feel that they have failed if they get rid of the tools for that hobby they're no longer doing and they didn't use them yet. Um, and I'd like to put a different spin on that, which is our interests can change and that is totally fine and it's not a failure to let go of the stuff related to the old hobby. In fact, it's probably gonna be pretty important to let that stuff go so that you maintain enough space 
to do the hobby, especially if it's a type of hobby where you need a lot of supplies. This one um, can trip people up. So that is one to watch out for. And then also this is um, a method I like to use where we lighten the mood when we make a mistake, if we let something go that we, we regret, um, it's going to happen. It's inevitable. We try to reduce the amount of mistakes we make, but there's no way around it. We have to take some risk and be willing to risk a mistake to go through this process. Um, and rather than beating yourself up, a different way to think about it is to say, oops, oops, oh well, like a little kid, if they're eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and they take a bite and the jelly drops on the floor, they just say, oops, and then they carry on, right? We clean it up and we carry on. So we want to have that same kind of mindset when we're thinking about getting rid of things. Obviously, we want to be careful, um, especially with heirlooms, memorabilia, things like that. But we don't want to berate ourselves um, when we do make a mistake because it's going to lower um, our ability to move forward because we'll be afraid to continue with that. Um, and then also, um, we want to be realistic about how we're letting go of things. So I have a lot of people who are very green in the Bay Area, which is a wonderful, wonderful value set to have. Um, but just like anything else, anything taken to an extreme can start to work against our other goals. So if you are trying to donate something or divert it from landfill and it's collecting dust in the corner, languishing month over month, then you'll want to really re reevaluate how much time and energy you're willing to spend with that. Because a lot of times um, there are these great organizations that will help you get rid of stuff, but the amount of steps you have to go through to get there is a lot of times just not realistic for the clients who I work with. And at some point they imperfectly let go of things. And the biggest change that they can make is watching what they bring into the home so they don't have to deal with as much on that back end of the process. Um, also, it'll help you just move more quickly through your process if you're focused on letting things go. And then sometimes in this step, people need to get outside support. Um, because this can be difficult, there are um, various groups and agencies of support available. One is Clutters Anonymous, and this one is great. I've had a lot of clients who were already meeting with Clutters Anonymous, either virtually or on site, um, before they started working with me. And I see a really big difference in those who have gone through that process or the next process I'm going to talk about versus those who haven't, because there's a lot of peer support with these groups, and there's also um, you can get declutter buddies, and they're also just really helping you understand what's going on behind the scenes, maybe emotionally in different, um, different areas that are affecting your ability with this part of the process. There's also Buried in Treasures. It's an amazing book written by some experts in the field of hoarding disorder. So I always mention this one. Um, you don't have to have hoarding disorder um, to utilize this book, but now there are national 20-week programs based off of this book that are really helpful to people. Um, also, there might be um, therapy involved at some point, either in letting go or if there is, a, whoops, excuse me, a challenge with um, compulsive acquiring, which can happen with that impulse control piece. Um, lastly, you can hire a professional organizer, hopefully someone who understands ADHD um, and chronic disorganization, anything like that. So this is that throwaway kind of purge part of the process. Now we're getting to organize. This is the part of the process most people are familiar with. And that's because they see it on TV, they see it in the magazines, they see it on the commercials, and it's where all the bins come in and things look pretty at the end. And it's only this, this part of it. And in fact, I try to... Um, diminish what people have to purchase as much as possible. A lot of times we get rid of so much that we empty out perfectly good containers that we can reuse. Um, some other things to keep in mind here, 
we need to designate a street address for our items. So I liken it to when you go outside, let's say today you went out for coffee or you went to work. Uh, when you came home, you didn't stop three blocks away and open up uh, a door to a random house to go in, right? Um, and it's an extreme example, but it gives a good visual of your stuff needing to be the same. It needs to go back to the same street address, just like you did when you came home from work or when you came home from getting coffee or, or whatever that was. So think about street addresses and wanting to really keep things right where their home is. And then we're talking about um, oops, um, labels. And these are people really know about labels a lot and label makers. You don't have to have a label maker, but having labels, especially if there's multiple people who live in the same home can be really helpful. Um, even if you live alone, they can be helpful as your working memory, which is, can be challenged for people with ADHD. Um, it, it's like having a crutch until you remember where things are. It can be very helpful. And you can label in lots of different ways. Um, it doesn't have to be uh, with a label maker, like I said. Again, clear containers. A lot of people are familiar with this already, but I bring it up because for a lot of people I work with, they're worried that if we put things away out of sight, it will be out of mind. Um, now, the flip side of that is that if everything is out, then that system breaks down and they can't find things anyway. And then they start to repurchase more. So we try to work out a balance. But having things like clear containers means that you don't only have to rely on the label there, but you can also see what's inside. This is where glass front um, cabinetry can be helpful as well. And that's a nice, happy medium for um, a lot of couples too. Because uh, when I work with couples, a lot of times there's one person who has ADHD and someone who doesn't. And one person wants to leave things out so they can remember where they are. And for the other person, it's really stressing them out to have everything out. So that's a nice medium to have. Then um, we also want to be aware of friction points. Um, by this, I mean kind of the UG factor. So it, you need to slow down your brain enough to notice this. But it's just that slight annoyance factor you get, uh, especially when you're trying to put something away. So I've worked with a lot of clients, for instance, who have dressers. Um, and when I go to help them put things back in the dresser, we're, I'm really struggling to push the drawer in or to get it out. And so I will address that and say, wow, this is, this is a challenge just to get this drawer open and closed. If this was me and my home, I wouldn't be putting anything away and I'm a professional. So um, is this working for you? And most of the time they'll say no. And we'll talk about other things that we can do. And maybe a dresser isn't right. Maybe hanging things up isn't right. And that's okay too. Maybe they need a shelf or a bookshelf with bins. They chuck the clothes in and they're done. And that's fine too. But you want to notice those little annoyance factors because those can be the straw that breaks the camel's back in terms of maintaining your systems. Um, so we want to make things easy. And then also we want to go broad uh, when we're filing. We don't want to micro categorize um, because it will take too much time to find what we need and we'll end up most likely with duplicate files. Okay, then we're on to persevering. This is your maintenance part of the uh, entire process. So as long as we're alive, we're going to be bringing things into the home um, and we need to find places for them. And we also need to have things leaving the house to make space for what's coming in. A few points I want to make here. Um, habit stacking. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of that. Um, but for those of you who have not heard of it, it's really all about kind of merging two habits together. Let's say, for instance, you drink coffee every morning. It's a really strong habit. You're not going to skip it because it helps you wake up in the morning. It helps get you going and get you focused. Um, and you're trying to um, 
put your dishes away in the morning so that you have enough for uh, mealtime at the end and you're not rushing, um, constantly rushing and running out of time. So when the coffee is brewing, um, four minutes at a time perhaps, you can then just wash as many dishes or put as put away as many dishes as you can in that four minute time slot. Now, for a lot of people I work with, four minutes is not going to cut it for clearing their entire sink, but eventually you will get to that point and you'll just be maintaining. So that's habit stacking, which can be very helpful. Um, there are also apps that you can use to gamify this experience, um, almost like a video game. One of them is called Habitica. Um, where you get an avatar, and if you do the habits you want to do each day, um, your avatar will get stronger. Um, so it's a fun way to interact and do things a little bit differently. Also, it can be really difficult for a lot of people with ADHD to get started on a task because they need a little bit more of that dopamine hit than a neurotypical would to get started on a task. Um, and that's where that stress comes in of, oh my gosh, I have to do this by tomorrow. And all of a sudden you can do it really easily because the level was raised. You can artificially raise that a bit um, with adrenaline and doing something like beating the clock. So if you are able to put your laundry away in 20 minutes yesterday, uh, next week, you might try to do it in 19 minutes. So it raises that level, but not in a really stressful way, more in a fun way to be able to, to do that. Then also this one I know is, is hard for those with ADHD, but slowing down enough, taking just a deep breath. And um, according to the literature, that's going to make this part of your brain that makes logical decisions come back online so that you have a little bit of wiggle room in terms of time to um, check those gut level reactions. For instance, if you're about to impulse buy something and you don't have the space for it, if you take a deep breath, it buys you a second or two to really think about, is this going to help me moving forward or is this just going to exacerbate what's going on at home? Um, and that one really does work. That one works really well as well for anxiety in terms of letting go of items. Um, I use some breathing techniques with a lot of my clients um, and immediately they, it helps them to calm down. So that's helpful there as well. Um, this one's a big one too, making use of external deadlines. Um, for whatever reason, when um, I'm coming to an appointment, someone will say, oh my gosh, I wanted to do this task before you came. And, and I remembered last night that you were coming, so I did it. And it's not because I'm punitive in any um, way, shape, or form. It's because they had that external accountability, that external deadline that came up and all of a sudden they were able to do it. So again, you can artificially do this as well. And there's various ways to do this, but one is just to have people over periodically. Um, a lot of times when I'm working with people, the dining room table is a big one. And if we can get that cleared off, they can then have um, family over again for dinner. And that's a big part of uh, their goal is that social aspect. Um, so um, that can be a nice one to work towards. Uh, and then also having um, house cleaners come every few weeks or every week if you can afford it. This one works really well for a lot of my clients. Some of them are already intuitively doing this um, and it can be quite, quite helpful. Um, so this is the STOP acronym, and again, sort, throwing away or tossing items, which includes donations, recycling, all that good stuff, and then we're organizing what remains, and then we're persevering. And you can use this for large clutter that you have, for papers, you can use this for digital clutter. I have yet to find anything it doesn't work for. Um, and this process really does work well. So what I'd like to do now is pause just for any questions that may have popped up or even any comments. I don't see any questions in the chat, but please feel free to um, put your question and I'll read it out for you. Great. Okay, so we'll keep going here. So now we're going to get to the second part, and this is going to be the, the biggest part of my presentation. Um, I can't 
see anyone right now, but um, I'm wondering if anyone has heard of Thomas E. Brown's model for ADHD and executive functioning. Um, you can raise your hand or you can put it in chat. Um, and this is a way to explain what's going on in the brain of uh, someone who has ADHD and the different types of functions and tasks that the brain needs to do that might be um, challenged for those who have ADHD or they might need to work things differently. So what we have here are six different ways that the brain will work. One is an activation, which is really starting a task. Another is focus. Um, so being able to um, filter out external um, stimulus or stimuli that really is not important. Um, effort, maintaining that effort, even though a task, for instance, might be boring. Um, working through emotions, um, big emotions sometimes. Um, also working memory uh, challenges uh, and being able to recall past instances of something to utilize that information again. And then the action phase kind of monitoring what you're doing in the action. Um, so again, um, I think a lot of this will resonate with those on the call who have ADHD and um, any given one of these might resonate at different times. There's a situational variability to ADHD um, where you might have a lot of this going on if a task is hard or boring. And then if a task is really enjoyable or fun, none of these might be affecting you because you are naturally interested um, in, that cat uh, in that task. So sometimes it can be confusing for neurotypicals because they're thinking, well, this person was able to do this other task that's similar. Why can't they do this one? It might be the inherent interest in any of these other things can be going on um, if it's not of inherent interest right away. So we're going to jump into each of these. And the first one is activation. This is that getting started. So for a lot of neurotypical people um, who are not dealing with ADHD, they might be able to just get going. They say, okay, I've got to do this task. I really don't want to do this task today, but I'm just going to do it. And they just get into it right away and power through it. For those with ADHD, it's not so simple. Um, there's a lot that goes into getting started. Um, and so I want to address some of these things and um, what I do when I'm working with clients who have ADHD. A lot of times, um, let's say, for instance, someone wants to um, do their laundry between our current session and the next session that we have um, because they want to have their laundry clean so that anything they don't want, they're able to donate because it's clean and ready to go at the end of the next session. Um, it's a great goal to have. Um, and so what I say is that's awesome. Um, what or how will you make that happen? And what they'll say a lot of times is, oh, I'll just do it, or I should just be able to do it, not a problem. But um, I usually challenge them on this because a lot of these things that we quote unquote should just be able to do are many steps involved. Laundry is not just one big step. Um, we might have to run to the bank and get quarters if we don't have our own laundry in our own home. Or if we do, we might go to do laundry and remember that we don't have um, laundry detergent. And so we have to go back and forth. And then um, we have to make sure we have enough time to do a whole load and it doesn't end up um, sitting in the dryer or waiting to go into the dryer getting um, mildewed because we ran out of time. Um, and that's just the first part of the laundry process, right? So it's a really big um, project. And so um, challenge that gut level reaction when you say, I should just be able to do it. Really give yourself some grace that it's going to take a little bit more. Um, and that organizing part can be challenging for people. Um, a command center. Now, what this is, is... Um, a basket or a bin or some sort of container of the supplies you're going to need when you're going through that STOP phase, um, that phase we just talked about. Um, that way, 
whenever you go to declutter, you're in, let's say you have a half hour to do it. Um, you don't end up spending 10 minutes looking for your Sharpies and your post-its um, and your masking tape or whatever it is you need to use during that session. It's already there and it's contained so you can pick it up and walk it to whatever room you're working on. So that's part of that organizing piece that happens before we even get started on something. Then there's the prioritization, and prioritizing can be challenging for some of those with ADHD, um, and it can make it hard to let go of items too, because everything feels like it has the same level of importance, and it's the same thing with a lot of decluttering tasks too. So I use the example of um, purging your papers. And not every task is worthy of the same amount of effort. Um, so we want to keep an eye on that. You could go down the rabbit hole of research and look for the perfect microcut shredder that you're going to need um, when you are purging your papers or let's say old taxes or what have you. Um, but if you spend eight hours doing that research, maybe only needed one hour to research and purchase the shredder that you wanted and the other seven hours you're already that farther that much farther ahead in the project um, so ask yourself how much time is this task worth um, also there's the eisenhower matrix i'm not going to get into this too much today you can look it up online afterwards but basically this is a four quadrant way to prioritize the things that you want to do in life and it goes from not important to important and urgent to not urgent and a lot of people spend most of their time in the urgent quadrants because that's what gets our attention you know, the shiny object or the important object that happens um, but where we really want to be spending a lot of our time is in the important yet not urgent quadrant. So you can go through your tasks and really try to analyze which one's really important in terms of my life goals and giving me the most satisfaction. Um, certain things can be delegated or outsourced so that you don't have to do them. Um, I have clients who who just cannot stand doing laundry and they had the resources then to outsource it so they can spend their time doing things that are really important to them. So that's just one example. And then activating, again, this is starting the process. So I, I like to use this example of um, getting connected to your future self. For a lot of people with ADHD, there's, I'm sure you've heard the now and the not now. And then everything that's not now feels really nebulous and, and really hard to connect with. One way to do that is to envision your future self and connect with that person emotionally. So um, I have I started doing this a few years ago with dishes, for instance. Most of the time I get my dishes done at night, but there are some nights when I'm just tired and I don't want to do it. And that's fine. No big deal. Um, and uh, perfection is the enemy of good. But there are times when I know I'm going to have a, a really um, high paced morning and I want to set myself up for success that next morning. So even though I'm tired and I don't want to do the dishes and it's just that ugh factor, um, I will tell myself, hey, Judith, your future self tomorrow will thank you. And then I'm like, OK, I'm going to do it for that person, just like I would do it for a loved one. Right. Um, and the next morning I'll go to my kitchen sink and. I have a clean sink and I will say, oh my gosh, thank you, past Judith. Thank you for helping me out. And you do it in a humorous way and it, it can be fun and make it a little bit more fun and connect you more to what you want to be doing. Uh, you can also create a fun theme. And um, for a lot of people, organizing is not um, the most enjoyable activity that they will be doing. So um, they can create a theme around it that makes more sense to them and makes a connection, an emotional connection more. So for instance, let's say you have a craft room. A lot of people I work with are very creative and have a lot of crafts. Um, what happens though is they end up having so many tools that they don't have the space to um, do their hobby. So in order to think about how am I going to organize this, 
They can think of their favorite craft store and the sections that are there and mimic those sections when they're organizing their own space to make it more enjoyable and to make it make more sense for people. So that's that first executive function um, and challenges that may arise and ways to work with that in the process. And I like this quotation. Um, it's from Organizing for the Creative Person. It's it's funny. So I'll go ahead and read this to see if it resonates. It's a nice way to put things on their head in terms of um, our mindset. It says, if you say, I really should clear off my desk, you aren't recognizing that you've actually made a decision not to do this work. You're saying, I really should, but I'm not gonna but I am going to feel guilty about it. And because I feel guilty about it, I must be a conscientious person. In a way, you're fooling yourself. Whenever you say, I have to do that, ask yourself, why do I have to do that? What makes me think I have to do that? And you'll probably answer, I have to because I want to get certain results. And that changes the statement. That statement is now, if I want A, then I have to do B, and that statement alone can make a tremendous difference in your life. Then you need to decide whether or not you really want to do it. So I like this quotation because one, I can relate to it personally. Two, I know a lot of my clients can as well. And it it just, it's again, using humor can really help with this process that sometimes can feel overwhelming. And this is just a different way to think about things that you want to get done. It it feels more empowering rather than an outside force telling you what to do. Any questions popping up before we jump into the next one? Yes, we do. We do have a few questions. Okay. Uh, Carrie asks, how to deal with children's clutter? Okay. There different ways you can tackle this. And a lot of it depends upon um, the child. I've definitely worked with families where um, the parents want to declutter when the child is not there because the child wants to keep everything and they know already what the important toys are that the child likes the most. And that works in some respects. Typically, I I would say we don't ever organize or throw away other people's items without their permission. It's a little bit different with with children. Um, But I've also worked with other families where they get the children involved. And so I'm actively working with the child and going through that same stop methodology with them and gamifying it. Um, There's a game from um, Judith, one of Judith Kohlberg's books, Friends, um, Acquaintances and Strangers. And basically you, and this is, geared towards adults, but I've done it with children and it's worked really well, um, where you sort your items by those that feel like friends to you. You're going to have to explain what acquaintances mean to a lot of younger children, but it's, it's like people who come in and out of your life and they don't necessarily stay there forever. And then the strangers are people you don't know at all. And so if they can categorize within those, it's a fun way for them to say, oh, that one's a friend, that one's a stranger or an acquaintance. And then um, the strangers go away easily because they're strangers. The friends, obviously, we keep. And the acquaintances, you could say, we let go of these. They come into our lives, but they don't necessarily stay there forever. So that's a tactic that I've used that has worked. Um, But involving the kids can be helpful if if they're willing to, to work within that. Great question. Question from John. Um, Can you give us some idea for cleaning with kids who have ADHD? So that's a similar question, or is that Uh, cleaning with children who have with them? Yes. Yeah. So I would, as much as you can, try gamifying things. And what we're going to talk about this for adults here as well. But trying to do competitions, family competitions. Um, You can create um, 
like let's say who's going to declutter their room the quickest will win a prize or if we can collectively do this room together in this amount of time we get a prize um, and these strategies that I'm talking about for adults, you can use for, for children as well. Um, and we're going to continue any of these I talk about here. I think for the most part, they can work for children as well. You don't want to have them. Um, one of the examples that's in a lot of books is you can't go to a, a kid who has ADHD and say, clean your room or really any child if they're young enough, because they don't know what that means. And even clean room or tidy room means something different entirely, even to couples I work with, each party in the couple. Um, so for a child, they might not know what cleaning means. How do they know when they're done? So you want to be specific and show them what that means and show them how to do it. Um, so you could show them this stop analogy and go through it. Um, and you can make it a team effort where you could say, I'm having trouble with my home office. Um, and sometimes the kid will jump in and be like, oh, did you, did you do the S yet? So, you know, if they can kind of own that and they can call out their parents on the same thing, that can be helpful too. Question from Sarah. Digital photos are so out of hand. How can I organize them? Um, so there are um, ways that you can do it yourself. There's also, there are photo organizers. There are people like me who only focus on organizing photos. Um, so you can reach out to those people if you need them. But um, again, what I would do is the same STOP, I would sort the photos in a way that makes sense to me. And for a lot of people, it's just going to be chronological um, and putting them into albums that way. And then the T would be going through and purging. A lot of times we take a lot of pictures at the same event and you would go through and, and purge and keep maybe just the one that you want. Um, and then organizing what remains, if you want to organize it um, by date, you could. You can also, there are tools now that can start to identify people's faces and plug in people's faces and, and all that. Um, I don't do that type of organizing, but um, you can get to that level um, with a, a photo organizer. Um, if you have um, analog photos, one of the easiest things to do is just to quickly go through and purge when you have uh, five pictures of a landmark or blurry pictures. Um, I did this years ago. I had um, a lot of photos and I went through on my own and just started purging the duplicates or the people I didn't even know who I had gone to school with. I didn't remember them anymore. So I would toss those. And just by doing that, I was able to get rid of half of my photos. Um, so you can do the same thing with digital there. Okay, a question from another Sarah. I love ideas on how to organize things that don't have an obvious place. For example, toiletries, products that don't fit in a uh, don't fit in small bathroom cabinet, and how to decide whether to keep something you might read or use. Ah, okay. So the first part, there's um, we're that's that organized part of the phase. So what you want to make sure you have done already is gone through and purge the things you really don't need because 99.9% .9 of the time, that's a big part of the issue for people I work with. Um, even we could fit the most beautiful organizational system together, but if there's too much stuff for the space, it, it's going to collapse every time that system. Um, so if you've done that, then there are certain toiletries um, that you can put. Sometimes people have powder rooms to the side, or there are, um, for instance, over the toilet um, um, shelving units that you can purchase to put items into. Um, and you can look in other rooms too for overflow space and just purge things within that room that you don't care about quite as much. And in terms of the getting rid of things um, that you're afraid to make that mistake on because you might need them in the future, that is, I hear that at least once every single time I organize and it happens to all of us. We don't want to waste money, but here's the thing. Um, 
all those quote unquote, just in case scenarios are squeezing out your ability to live in this space today. So all those possible futures, um, we're keeping all these items for possible futures that may or may not occur. And because of that, we can't live today in the space the way we know we want to live today. So I would say challenge yourself to let go. Um, start small with those items that are not incredibly expensive and um, practice making mistakes. Some of these books, well, one of them in particular we'll talk about, let go of something that you know you want to keep and it's going to feel uncomfortable. Um, and you can rate that level of discomfort. Don't start with something very important, like um, the only photo you have left of your mother or something. <laughs> you don't want a high stakes. But you start with something small. And a lot of people worry that they'll regret it. And you can check in a week later. And most people find out, I I'm not thinking about that thing anymore. It was okay to let that go. Um, so you really need to challenge that gut level reaction to keep things. Um, so. Great questions. I'm going to move on to make sure we have enough time, but we'll have another spot to ask questions as well. So with this um, focus, part of the, the challenge is getting the white noise, kind of the things, the stimulus out of the way, the stimuli that are not important. Um, one way I do this is when we're working uh, with, um, with clients is to move to another room in terms of a box. So you have a box or a container. And instead of as soon as, for instance, let's say you're decluttering your desk and you find um, there's something, you say, oh my gosh, I've been looking for this. And maybe it's a comb or something. And you go to bring it to the bathroom where you need to use it. Um, that's our natural instinct to do. But what it's going to do is distract you from the task at hand. And um, you'll most likely lose time that you only had for decluttering. Maybe you only had a half hour to begin with. And now you have 10 minutes because by the time you came back, um, you had done all these other things you didn't intend to. So instead, put everything that doesn't belong to that space into a move to another room box. And then towards the end of the session, you can go put those items away. Um, if you're having um, a hard time focusing and everything is overwhelming you visually, you can put a sheet over the area that you're not working on. And immediately that will help you to focus on the current task at hand. Uh, you can also repeat things out loud. So if you're going to put the mug in the sink, uh, you can on the way to the sink, I'm putting the mug in the sink, I'm putting the mug in the sink, and that will help you to focus on what you need to do and get rid of um, the other things that are pulling at your attention. Um, then there's that sustaining focus, and this can be a challenge if the task itself is boring. So um, one of the things that we can do is try 15 minutes at a time. And that's it. Um, and a lot of people fight me on this at first, not fight me, but they challenge me on this because they'll say, well, once I get going, I don't want to stop because I don't know when I'll ever have the motivation to do this again. So I need to do it all now. And the challenge is that when they end up doing that, there's a part of them in the future that remembers that heinous eight hour session that they did of decluttering on their own. And they don't ever want to do that again. So you want to start small, do 15 minutes, have a buzzer go off. When the buzzer goes off, you're done. Or if you want to continue, that's fine, but take a five minute break and then jump back in again. Before you jump back in, set the timer for 15 minutes again. This way you are not extending yourself out too far into the future. And also we do get diminishing returns when we make decisions nonstop for hours at end. Our brain just gets tired and we can't focus that long. Um, this sprinting a marathon piece right here, this is all about um, a lot of ADHDers being sprinters. Um, they can do short sprints really fast, but it's harder to continue out and work towards a goal that is far out to the future, like a marathon would be. 
Um, so what a lot of people will do is they'll try to sprint that marathon. They'll try to sprint, sprint, go as fast as they can through that entire project, but they burn out um, because you can't sprint a marathon, right? So sprint in those 15 minute sessions instead, and then you can stop and um, continue on. Um, we also um, can use apps. There's an app called Forest that will help you focus. And if you continue focusing for the amount of time on your phone, you will grow a tree. And if you quit or you do something else on your phone, you will kill a tree and you're trying to grow a forest. So you can have fun with this too. Um, if you're using your phone too much when you're trying to declutter and you get distracted, you can turn the grayscale onto your phone, which makes everything much more boring. So that can be really helpful as well. Um, also having a notebook or your phone handy so that you can write down other tasks that you need to do that pop up as you're decluttering can be really helpful. So I have, when I'm working on something, if something else pops up in my mind, I have a dry erase board I use to keep um, that information handy, but I don't have to keep trying to remember that when I'm trying to focus on something else at the time. And then also shifting um, attention. This can be difficult for people. So when they're doing something fun, it can be hard to shift into, oh, now it's my time to declutter. You can use a lanyard that um, has a, a buzzer um, attached to it so that if you walk away from your phone, you still get that 15 minute hit. Um, you can also use a smartwatch that has a haptic pattern on it. And this one, um, you could set the 15 minutes. And if you end up going into hyper-focus, um, it will, you'll feel it on your wrist and it will help um, get you out of that hyper-focus mode. Um, so what we can do, I can answer, I say one more question right now. Um, before we jump into this other section, if there are any. Yes, we have a couple of questions. I'll read the first one. Um, would you comment on the traumatic decluttering practices shown on order TV coverage? Have you been able to assist persons whose housing is at risk due to collecting behavior and lack of household organization? And they said trauma, right? The, the, that tra word tra trauma? Uh, tra traumatic. Traumatic. Yes. Traumatic, yeah. Yeah. The, um, those shows are great and and controversial. They're great because they're um, helping people to realize they're not the only ones um, dealing with hoarding disorder. They're also um, controversial because um, because of the way they go through the process. And a lot of situations, uh, a fast clear out might be needed. Um, I have colleagues who do clear outs with teams and come in and do that because. If they don't, um, someone could end up getting evicted. Uh, luckily here in the San Francisco Bay Area, there are things that have to happen before you could get evicted. Um, and there's a lot more protection than people realize that there is. I don't typically do those fast clear outs. Um, maybe if there's an estate clear out um, and family members need my help. Um, and the, um, the person who lived there um, has passed away. But I usually work one-on-one -on -one and try to go at a decent pace, but not ripping off the Band-Aid really quickly like that because um, there'll be this knee-jerk reaction and people will be so upset at how much volume went out that they can start collecting more quickly than they ever did before after that process. Um, that doesn't always happen, but for me, I like to um, teach people what I know and um, help them to challenge that gut level reaction to keep. Um, sometimes there's a therapist who's needed to deal with that emotional piece, um, but there are ways you can deal with that. The Buried in Treasures groups or the book that I have on my shelf back here can be extremely helpful too. Um, so hopefully that helps a little bit. Okay, so we're going to jump in here to the effort section. Um, and I don't know, maybe some of you are getting sleepy at this part of the presentation. It's hard to stay awake when there's so much information um, coming at you. Um, there are ways that you can play around with this when you are decluttering. Let's say you're sorting out tops from bottoms and it's a low level brain activity. Try putting on some music so you don't get too tired or you can listen to a podcast even. Um, that helps to make 
projects um, a little bit more enjoyable. There's all sorts of white noise apps you can put on in the background that will help you focus um, and stay awake. Um, and some of those apps are Insight Timer, Spotify, Pandora. There's stuff on YouTube as well. Um, and then in terms of sustaining the effort, that maintenance piece, um, that can be the biggest challenge for a lot of people because it might be interesting to sort and to get rid of things. But then the everyday mundane, uh, they may think of it as mundane of um, doing uh, the task over and over again um, in terms of I've got to maintain and I got to spend five minutes tonight putting things back in their homes. One way that you can make this more manageable from this standpoint excuse me, is to go through with your, um, look through your values and tie your why to your values. So there's something called VIA, which is values in action. This was created by um, one of the founders of the positive psychology movement. And I think it was 60, 50, 60 something researchers came together and researched a ton of different ways that people uh, find um value in life and get um, happiness or not happiness, but value out of life. And they came up with these values and you can go online and take these quizzes or this quiz um, questionnaire and figure out what your top values are and integrate that to help with motivation. So for instance, if you have a love um, or appreciation of beauty and excellence, um, that might help you to maintain your home because you really value having a cleared off uh, dining room table and the flowers that you can purchase and put there every week or every few weeks are beautiful. So you're playing to that value set, which can help. Um, Tiny actions are bigger or better than bigger ones. Um, so try really small tasks and breaking it down. Again, that 15 minutes is much more helpful than trying to do everything, sprinting over a marathon long weekend. Um, you can also do uh, competitions. I talked about that before. You could start it with your friends or family to see who can get rid of the most amount of items. And then in terms of processing speed, like how quickly can you do things? A lot of people I work with um, think that a particular declutter project is only going to take them an hour. And they're very disappointed to find out it takes them a lot longer than that. And there's um, a challenge with those who have ADHD of estimating how much time a task will take. And that's because um, it's harder to think about all the steps that are necessary in that project. Um, so triple your time estimates or even quadruple them. And um, that will leave you with enough time to do your decluttering um, steps, the STOP method. Um, and also keep in mind that 30 minutes of decluttering really is only 15 minutes of decluttering because you need to give yourself enough time to tidy up. If you use the floor to um, create different piles of different categories of papers, that's great. Um, but at the end, you need to pick those piles up, put labels on them and put them away somewhere so you're not tripping over them, right? Um, any, uh, I can answer a second question right now as well. Um, I see a couple comments, uh, self-reflective. I'll ask um, this question maybe. Um, what are the main differences in helping a ADHD versus a neurotypical client? Having a hard time letting things go because they are sentimental or thinking you will pick up the hobby again later sound normal to me. That is um, actually an example that happens to neurotypical clients too. It happens to all of us. Um, I mean, everyone I've met, me included, certain things are hard to get rid of, but we've, we've got to challenge that gut level um, reaction. So that process there is the same. I ask, there's all sorts of questions you can ask yourself to get at why you're keeping it. Um, so that one example before that I gave of... Um, I'm keeping this just in case I need it in the future. But in the meantime, it's taking up three feet or six feet of space. And I really wanted to get a treadmill in here so that I can get into shape. And I can't do that. And I know I want to do that because of these other just in cases crowding out the space. So that's an example of something that you would ask. Um, 
Also, I try, we try to make things as fun as possible. I break down a lot of projects with people because, again, that part of that executive functioning can be a challenge for those with ADHD where they see the big picture, but they can't see the multiple steps or they get overwhelmed by how big this project is. So um, we will break down the steps. I'm working with everyone on habit formation, but we have to sometimes do things in a different way. Um, we'll use their creativity, do things in a zany way, um, more memorable ways that will help them remember things. Um, so those are a few of, of the examples as well. But that having a hard time letting go of something because you might use it again in the future, um, that happens to even clients I have who are neurotypicals. That's a great question. Okay, so we'll keep going here. I've got a few more of these to go through. Um, emotion is a big one. Um, and this is uh, something that a lot of the experts in the ADHD realm say is not really addressed with um, di diagnostics um, when someone's getting diagnosed for ADHD, but they see this challenge coming up a lot for people when they get help for their ADHD. And this comes into the process with decluttering as well. So a lot of people do get frustrated during the process. Um, so again, um, they'll hit these friction points. And so I will talk them through at what point is frustrating. Um, what can we do to eliminate this frustration point and make things simpler? Um, so for instance, um, I was talking with someone recently about laundry and um, had talked about well, maybe just keep each person's laundry 100% separate in different um, bins and never the two shall mix. So you just do one person's laundry at a time and it goes right back into their room so that you you eliminate the sorting process altogether, right? This can be helpful, especially with um, having children. Um, so there are all sorts of things you can look at of, is this step really necessary? Um, also get rid of things that are broken or that impair are impairing your ability to quickly do something. So it might be a rickety, um, um, file cabinet, it might be a broken desktop sorter, they're not worth the time and effort it takes to maintain that. Um, and then dealing with the emotions, a lot of times people have a hard time because this work is boring for them. So we want to dig dip deeper, I don't want to do this. Well, let's talk about why um, you're not wanting to do this. So one is it's boring. And so again, gamifying the um, the process with competitions. How quickly can you do it? How much can you get out? Um, how much um, how much can you let go of and get it out of the house quickly? So use your imagination, all sorts of ways you can do this. Um, you can document your wins. Um, so keep track of how much you're um, winning. So you can even put it on a whiteboard, especially if you have kids and the whole family can keep track of, oh, we got rid of another bag of um, clothes um, or we just gained six more inches of space on the bookshelf. And those collective things um, can add dopamine hits and you can feel better um, about, about moving forward. It's more motivating. Um, if you think that it's going to take forever, you can do time audits to see how long it actually takes to really do something that you have to do repetitively and take small steps. Um, you can practice being bored. That can be helpful as well. Um, if it's too hard, ask for help in breaking down the project um, because you might not be seeing all the steps that have to happen and that might be what's tripping you up. Um, and don't create overly complicated systems. I've worked with a lot of people who have systems that are beautiful, color-coded, really great, but they're unrealistic to maintain because they, um, they're too hard and they take too much time on a regular basis. Um, memory, again, working memory can be a challenge for those who have ADHD. So write everything down, get things out, get them onto your calendar. If you're going to um, donate something, um, don't just put it down and say, oh, I'll remember to do it later. Um, go ahead and schedule that into your calendar. You can also have a notebook that has all these parts written in there. So why are 
are you decluttering? Why is it important? What are your projects? What are the steps? What are some rewards you can take right away? How can I document my wins um, and deadlines? Um, we talked about some of these already, but having loud reminders to do things, whether it's a loud phone ring or a loud color that you're using as a reminder, um, and periodically moving those around or changing them up can help. Um, and again, the less you have, the easier it's going to be to deal with that. Um, and then also accessing uh, recall. So um, leave yourself a big crumb trail, crumb trail with more, um, more. Um, context than you think you'll need. Um, and then lastly, we have the monitoring and uh, self-regulating of action. If you're having a hard time um, seeing what's going on, take photos. There's nothing like smushing data down into a two-dimensional photo that shows you thing in, things in a brand new way. You'd be surprised how much you could start to see that you have. Um, you can also go to the Institute for Challenging Disorganization and look at their clutter through hoarding scale. Um, and you can look at exactly where your clutter is in terms of um, how it's affecting your uh, ability to do things on a daily basis. It's not a diagnostic tool, but it can be very helpful. Um, body doubles are huge. I'll just mention a few of these quickly. Um, I do body free body doubling sessions um, with people in my newsletter audience. This one's huge for people with ADHD. Uh, basically, you can have someone sit in the room with you or on the computer. And as long as you are, um, they are in the room, maybe reading a book or something, it helps you to stay focused on the task at hand for that amount of time that you're going to work. Uh, the container of the limiter, as soon as your magazine rack is full and another magazine comes in, that is your visual cue to get rid of something so that the container limits the volume that you keep. Um, Rewards, you can save a, a reward and only do it after decluttering. That can be helpful too. Um, the one in, one out can help with maintenance, taking one thing out of your home for everything you bring in. But for a lot of people, they need to get five things out uh, for every one item or even a higher um, ratio to get things out quickly. And sometimes there's support that is needed. So that's this executive functioning. And these are all these different examples that you can use um, to really help yourself stay focused and um, go through the paces. Um, so if you have any takeaways, if there's been any insight you've had or something that you think you'll do, go ahead and put that into the chat. Um, or if there was something you hadn't thought about before, put that in the chat. A lot of times people will see that they're not alone in, in their challenges and, and doing things in a different way. And um, what will you implement diff differently today? Um, these are additional resources here. Um, and whoops, excuse me. Um, there are a lot of different books. That, some of these are older, but they're classics. And I like the information that's inside of them. Smart But Stuck is a great book by Thomas Brown um, that has some case studies in there as well. More Attention, Less Deficit by Ari Tuckman is a huge book, but it's written in article format. So you can flip around a lot. Um, ADD Friendly Ways to Organize Your Life by Judith Kohlberg, um, who founded um, the Institute for Challenging Disorganization. Um, she wrote that book with Kathleen Nadeau. And then Organizing for the Creative Person by Dorothy Lemkel and Dolores Cotter Lamping can be helpful. Um, additionally, Dr. Russell Barkley, who is one of the experts in the field of ADHD, has just recently retired, um, but now has started a YouTube channel. On a weekly basis, he gives updates of different types of um, um, research that has come out and his thoughts on it. Um, additionally, you can join my newsletter where I give updates on when the next um, body doubling is going to be. You'll get a free PDF. Um, I also do deep dives into ADHD, into hoarding disorder, um, and a lot of other information as well. Um, so that is it in a nutshell. And if there's any last questions that I can answer, I'm happy to stick around for that as well. And this is my phone number, um, and my website and my email, I-N-F-O, that's as an information, info at twilightorganizing.com if you have more questions too. 
Thank you. Thank, thank you, Judith. Uh, we have a few more questions, but it's already 610. <laughs> I want to respect your time and everyone's time. Um, is it okay if the participant email you their questions? Okay. Absolutely, yes. Okay. So I want to um, thank everyone for taking the time to to stick stick with us and and hear all all the bits of information. Is is it okay if I put your email address in the chat? Because on your slide it yes. doesn't have your okay. Let Absolutely. Me, okay, let me copy the email address and put it in here. Okay, so so I-N-F-O at twilightorganizing.com. And there's a lot of information on my website too um, that you can look through. Okay. Thank you so much, Judith. Uh, really, really appreciate you sharing with us the strategies um, uh, to create spaces and essential uh, decluttering process. Um, I also want to thank everyone for joining the program. My wish is that we all depart this presentation infused with fresh energy and eager to embark on some decluttering. Um, I'll send out an evaluation survey together with the recording link um, and Judith's uh, presentation um, presentation slides, which will include the, the resources uh, list on the last page. And um, please give us your feedback uh, so we can continue to improve. Again, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Bye-bye now. Bye.